I would like to go into uh, once more. It is not, it is one of two things that has helped to build Protestantism and maybe Christianity in general. Heaven and hell. Where will you be? Heaven promises bliss for eternity. Hell promises eternal torment. The choice seems easy, right? So why isn't everybody making the choice for eternal bliss? Who is offering these two choices? A God who is supposed to be a God of love and of justice. But let me ask you this. What could a man do to deserve eternal punishment? Punishment that is unending, going on and on and on. The clip asks about Charles Manson. Who, by the way, was never convicted of murdering anyone, but of planning, of planning it. But it talks about those kinds of persons. Really? How much killing can you do to deserve just eternal, eternal punishment? On uh, Trumpet's Pass, I was preparing to leave, and I don't like to come to services late. So I was ushering my family, we we're all going to travel together in my van. I was ushering my family to hurry up. And uh, as usual, I set the tone, I was the first one outside. I went to, I believe it was on Monday, right? The trumpets this year was on a Monday. I was outside, preparing to go inside of the van. I placed something inside the van. My family wasn't out yet. I was the only one on the veranda. I didn't see any neighbors. I placed something in the van, closed the door, and then I felt a sharp pain just take over my entire body. I was in agony. There was nobody around. It was just me alone outside. And as I looked down to my horror, my finger was stuck in the door. The door slammed shut. As I was closing the door and turned away, I didn't turn away quickly enough, and the door just slid down. Gravity just took it down fast because it was slightly tilted. Slammed and it was stuck in the door. I was frantically trying to open it because it was clicked. It's not a dream, here's a finger still. Where is it still? Where is it all blackened still? I thought that my finger was broken and I might have lost it, but I was in such pain. My entire body was in pain. And it's like every nerve ending on you. This is just a finger in a small part of your body can generate so much pain. No, imagine a hell where people burn. Because burning is infinitely worse than it. Burning is one of the worst forms of death, along with perhaps being eaten alive by wild animals. One of the worst forms of death. Right? I hear burning, 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 burning. Oh, it, it is your entire body is engulfed in pain. Now, my pain, my finger was stuck in the door for a few seconds, and the pain lasted on and off intensely. I reached services. I tried to concentrate on the services while I kept it on an ice pack. Sleep was difficult during the night, first nights or so, and then gradually it dissipated. 
No, that was ge generated by a few seconds. Now, can you imagine being stuck for an entire day, being tortured with that level of pain? Make it a week. A month. A year. A decade. A century. A millennium. On and on and on. No, what could you possibly do? To deserve that. This from a God of love and of justice who preaches fairness. Our worldly authorities know that crime must fit the punishment. And that everybody who the preachers say are destined for hell are murderers anyway. Some of them just never either heard about Christ, never understood it, just never accepted it. And for that is eternal punishment. But those questions may very well be just philosophical. God is sovereign, is he not? God is sovereign. Let us not impose our ideas on a sovereign God. He has spoken. So let us hear what he has to say. Our format today will be more of a Bible study. So reach for your Bibles. Because oftentimes our critics say that we question God through high philosophy and not through the Bible. Today, we will put that to the test. One, one of the pillars that this hellfire doctrine, ever burning hell doctrine is built on is the use of the term forever in scripture. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They were tormented day and night forever and ever. Hmm. Hmm. Forever and ever. Revelation 14. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image. Or for anyone who receives the mark on his forehead. Matthew 25. Turn quickly, Matthew 25, verse 7. Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. This is the parable of the, the foolish virgins, the, the wise ones and the foolish ones. The foolish ones said to the wise one, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Hold on. 
did I get this? All right, let's turn to verse 32. In the same chapter 25. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So here he is separating them. In verse 41, then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is Jesus speaking now. In verse 41. He's speaking on behalf of himself and the Father. He says, this is what will be said. Depart from me, you are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Here's a contrast now. Here's a clincher in this, in same Matthew 25, verse 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. What does this mean? Isn't this quite clear? Isn't this very clear? That eternal punishment, unending punishment, is reserved for the unrighteous. This, the last text I quoted you, was Jesus himself speaking. This wasn't an, even one of the apostles. So what is the case? Well, first of all, we know the Bible wasn't written originally in English, right? That's correct. What does eternal mean? Does it always mean never ending? Okay, the Greek word that is used throughout the New Testament for, that is translated forever, is aenos. And that has, that's not the only meaning for it. If you have a strong concordance, or if you have a concordance with you, it, Ienos can mean a space of time, an age. It can mean an age, a cycle of time. For a time, especially in the present age. And it's usually a contrast with a future, future age, all right? Let me show you an example in Jude. Turn with Jude. Turn with me to Jude. And we know there's only one chapter in Jude, so we'll go straight to verse 7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve and as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah is on the earth and is not burning now. And the same term was used. So it does not have to mean in perpetuity. It does not have to mean that it, is, it will go on in perpetuity. The word that was used in Hebrew is olam. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 24. We're using up a lot of scriptures today. But there's one thing when we're preaching inspirational, there's another thing when we're going into doctrine. This distinguishes the church of God 
from the others. I have no band music playing in the background to hype you up. And at the end of, of my message today, I won't be making any altar call based on the high tempo of the keyboard. Use your mind and let it be guided by scripture. Exodus chapter 12 verse 24 Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. You shall observe this rite as an ordinance for you and for your sons forever. This particular ordinance is not in effect today, but it was noted that it should have been done forever. Forever doesn't always mean unending. It's for the purpose for which it was intended. Okay? So to use the strict term forever to apply to hell and to use the scriptures that I quoted first is not accurate. In Exodus chapter 40 and verse 15. Anoint them just as you anointed their father, so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to a priesthood that will continue for all generations to come. For all generations to come. Yet, that priesthood is not in effect today. The Aaronic priesthood has come to an end. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going through them very quickly. So we have a myriad of texts on the subject. We don't have to make up time by preaching and ignoring the text. We can spend most of this message just going into the text. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 13. From verse 12, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. So the Solomonic temple was built and it was said to go on forever, but today it is no more. It has served its intended purpose. Back to Exodus chapter 27. Reading from verse 21. We'll start from 20. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning in the tent of meeting outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony. Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. In some translations, forever. But in more accurate translations, it will say for generations come, meaning implying that it has a built-in obsolescence. It was not intended to go on forever. So clearly we see that to hang on to a text that uses the word forever does not necessarily mean it is intended to go on into perpetuity. So that should alert you right away that it was not intended to go on into perpetuity. But there's another term that is used, apart from the, the term forever, that is used to justify this doctrine. That is unquenchable fire. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew 
Matthew chapter 3. From verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his stretching floor, gathering his wheat from the barn and burning up the shaft with unquenchable fire. No, that is different from just the use of the word forever. This says unquenchable fire. So you cannot get your garden hose. Fire service won't be effective with this one. This is more destructive than the wildfires in California. But what does it really mean? Let us look at another example. In Jeremiah 17, in Jeremiah 17, in verse 27 of Jeremiah 17 but if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath days holy by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortresses. An unquenchable fire. If the people were, going, were disobedient you know, in their observation of the Sabbath day, an unquenchable fire Jehovah would cause an unquenchable fire to burn. No. We know that they were not obedient. That spells that they were and spells that they weren't. So where is that fire today? Unquenchable simple means that no one can stop it until its purpose is fulfilled. That's a simple meaning of unquenchable. It doesn't mean that it will never stop, but that you cannot bring any elements to stop it yourself. This is a fire from Jehovah. And when he sends it down, it will accomplish its purpose. But clearly, Apart from the skirmishes from time to time, Jerusalem is not on fire today. We know that there are disagreements and flare-ups in that city from time to time, but it is not on fire today. In Isaiah 34, Isaiah 34, verses 9 and 10. Edom's stream will be turned into pitch, her dust into burning sulfur, her land will become blazing pitch. It will not be quenched night and day, its smoke will rise forever. Yet that is not the case today. That is not the case today. So again, to refer to the earlier text that I had quoted, to use those terms to make a definitive case is incorrect. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. There is a proper understanding of unquenchable fire. Make note of that Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 31, the mighty man will become tinder and his work a spark. 
Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. That is simply what unquenchable fire is. No one can quench that fire. But there's another case. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man. In the book of Luke, chapter 16. In the book of Luke, chapter 16. What was the point of that story of Lazarus and the rich man? In the story, Lazarus is poor and he sits and begs at the rich man's table for the crumbs that would fall. He begs the rich man. No, there came a time when both of them died. Lazarus is taken to heaven. And the rich man down to hell. No, he wanted to send a warning. He wanted to send a warning. So he says, listen, tell my friends what is happening down here. But what really was the point? It's a parable. First of all, let me alert you to parables. They are not, they are not stories to be taken literally. So you take every piece of it literally. It's an allegory. It's, it's, it's meant to, to convey a moral tale. Right? So there was no literal Lazarus and there was no literal rich man that he was relating to. Jesus was trying to convey a message. What was that message? The people in Jesus' time were ignoring the call. John the Baptist had made a call. And when his ministry had finished, Jesus took up the... He was calling them to repentance. The point of Lazarus and the rich man was that the rich man thought he had all the time because he was comfortable. So he wasn't using his time properly. But there came a point where his time came to an end. And he had to be held account. So Jesus was trying to convey to the people, listen, the time that you have to repent is not going to just go on and on and on and on and on. At some point, you'll be called into account. It also shows that despite your wealth and your comfort, there's general insecurity and the futility of an ordinary life. This is what he was trying to convey. Right? But he was just using uh, the familiar terms at the time. In Luke uh, 12, in Luke 12 and verse 20. Let me have home that point. Luke 12 and verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared? So Jesus was on that theme when he spoke that parable. So here's a, a, another rich man feeling comfortable and he was saying, listen, don't take any comfort in your riches and your wealth. You will be held accountable. And then your wealth will not be able to assist you. It's a simple tale. Hades to the Greek is a Greek word for hell, and that's what predominantly features in the New Testament. In Revelation 22, Revelation 22. And verse 20. Uh, 
sorry, verse 12, Revelation 22 and verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So he, here, the point was being re-emphasized about urgency. Because he's saying, you, your reward or your punishment is on the way. And I will come, I will appear to you more quickly than you expect. What really is the fate of the wicked? If not an eternal hell, what really is the fate of the wicked? In Malachi, in the book of Malachi, you see we're going all over the Bible. All over the, the Bible we are going for this doctrine. In the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Surely the day, from verse 1, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and e every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So clearly, it's a case of them being burnt up. Not a root or a branch will be left. This is the case being made. So when Christ returns to the earth... The arrogance and the evildoers will be burned to stubble. Stubble cannot burn unending. It is burnt up. In Psalm 37, we're taking you through every kind of literature. This is not normally how... When the preachers are preaching, they take you through the Bible. But in the church of God, we're going through every aspect, every different phase of the Bible. So if they want poetic language, if they want prophetic, we're going to take them right through the Bible. In Psalm 37, verse 38. But all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. They will be destroyed. When something is destroyed, it is not going on and on and on. It is finished. That is the fate of the wicked. They will be destroyed. Romans chapter 6. I still have a lot of text left. Romans chapter 6. We're going from the old to the new and back and through all different kinds of literature. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. There is a contrast. Death is contrasted with eternal life, which is unending. But the wages of sin, you get cut off, that's it. You are destroyed. Just like this doctrine is being destroyed. <laughs> the doctrine of the ever burning hell. First John chapter three. All fall 
Paul's teaching will be put under subjection from the pulpit of the church of God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. No murderer has eternal life in him. No, it could be argued that if you're in an ever bird in hell, you have a life. But no murderer has eternal life in him. I'll go back to the Old Testament again. Ecclesiastes. Going to the book of Ecclesiastes after the Proverbs. And we are in chapter 9. We're giving you, giving you in a slightly different form today. We have had lots of inspiration. We have come from the feast. Now we're going to be going through some fundamental doctrines. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9 and verse 5, it reads, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. The dead has no knowledge. When you are dead, you don't know. So we go to these funerals and we hear people talking about, oh, they must be very happy to see the turnout and, and they, they love the kind words and yes. It's completely false. The people aren't looking down and are happy. And by the way, you notice how everybody at these funerals gone to heaven, by the way. All of them got all of them got it. <laughs> so it looked like hell really empty after all. <laughs> Nobody down here. Uh, it's built for nothing. It's like this German airport I read about. Yes. They built this big airport in Germany to honor Willy Brandt. I, I think he was the longest serving German Chancellor yeah, in the 1970s. Yes, they built it with a budget of what? Uh, 1.3 billion. I know the Germans are efficient. Yes. I don't know what went wrong, but seven years after the airport was supposed to be open, it's still not functional, and they have asked for an additional 7.3 billion. No. And the air, they, are, they are changing the monitors and keeping all the equipment up to date and everything, but the rest of the infrastructure is just not in place. And the airport is just there, and there are workers there coming in, and everything, but it's not ready to receive planes. So it's like this hell. It's like it's built, and I don't know who's going there. But why they going there? Because when they go to the funerals, everybody is flitting off to heaven, and it's down there enjoying the music, by the way, and those special items that they give. Mm, 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 mm. They just love it up in heaven. And I don't know where they get those things from. In Matthew chapter 13. It's a Bible study, so but we'll have to get through it. Matthew chapter 13, let me try and speed it up. Verses uh, 29. This is a parable of the weeds. Do you want the servants asking, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both Grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them up in bundles to be burnt, then gather the wheat and bring it. Sorry, the, get, sorry. first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So, the weeds... weeds. No, I don't know about ganja. I'm, I'm, I'm not prejudiced about it. But the weed will be burnt. I suppose, P, I suppose Peter Tosh will agree with that. <laughs> but the weed will be burnt. <laughs> 
when Christ return, the weed will be burnt. Weeds, let me carry that, weeds. Oh, weeds. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 26, and this is a sober warning to all of us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. The fire will consume them. When something is consumed, it is finished. In Isaiah chapter 1 again, back to Isaiah chapter 1. For those of you who wish to take notes, I will see if I can put them together if you're having a problem keeping up. I think I have it in digital form, but still try and keep up. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 1. Can you imagine we were accused of the of those using philosophy to counter this doctrine? That we did not have the Bible on our side. Can you imagine? Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 28. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. Perish. They will perish. In another translation, in the RSV, it says, they shall be consumed. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on his ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and the seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? It was burnt to ashes. Burnt to ashes. Its inhabitants are no more. They aren't suffering over there in the Middle East. Burning, 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 unending. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example to those who were ungodly. A problem that the people who teach this doctrine have is that they completely misrepresent God. It is a smear on the character of God. It brings into question the fairness and the justice of God. The God whom we serve is a just God. It is out of mercy that he will put those who disobey out of existence. But that is not the God that is preached by the majority of churches. Instead, what we have is a sadistic God. A God who, if he does not have his way, wants to torture you and wants to get like he's getting some kind of pleasure out of it. Because imagine, he will have his kingdom set up where people are living in eternal bliss. And he knows at the same time. And those who are in the kingdom would also know at the same time that while they are in this eternal bliss, there are others who are unending, who are in unending suffering. What 
kind of universe is that where you have some people in eternal bliss and then there are others who are that sounds like the kingdom of man that sounds like the kind of kingdom that man now has not the kingdom of God cornerstone of Old Testament justice was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was a cornerstone. The principle whatever you visited on your neighbor, you'll be equally punished. Not unequally. Equal punishment for the crime. That is justice. And I believe if we reintroduce that standard in Jamaica today, we might be a whole lot better off. Equal punishment. Punishment that fits the crime. But instead, what we have preached is that God will set up a kingdom where you have the haves and the have-nots into perpetuity. Exactly the type of message Satan would want people to believe about God. Stain his character. That kind of doctrine should be burnt in hell. Burnt up and gone. What really is the soul? What is our understanding of the soul? In Genesis chapter 2, I'm telling you, I'm going to have to speed it up. Because I have so it's like I'm barely halfway into the text. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, a living being. That is what a soul is, a living, breathing being. In Leviticus chapter 7, as I try to move on quickly, Leviticus chapter 7, and at verse 20. But if anyone who is unclean eats any meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, that person must be cut off from his people. That, the word person there, the word person is the same word used for soul. In Matthew chapter 28, sorry, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. What does this mean? It simply means that if someone kills you, so for instance, you are taking a stand for God and you are killed. That's the end of what they can do to you. But if you are unfaithful, God has infinitely more uh, the ability to put you out of existence. Because you can be resurrected to damnation. But your enemies only have power over you in bodily form. But God can both put you to death now and put you out of existence. In Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. In verse 20 of the same Ezekiel, no, 
Verse 20 of the same Ezekiel chapter, Ezekiel chapter 18. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be on him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be on him. In Psalm 89 and verse 48, Psalm 89 and verse 48, What man is he that lives and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? The breath of life is sometimes used synonymously uh, with the soul. The, the breath of life, that is the energy and your consciousness is sometimes used synonymously with the soul. Let me give you an example of that. In Genesis 35 and verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. In verse 18, And as her soul was departing, for she died, that is in, in brackets, as her soul was departing, for she died, she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So here the breath of life, that is her consciousness and her energy, is equated with her soul. In 1 Kings 17 and verse 21, then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's soul come into him. That was the breath of life. In verse 17, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill and the illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. It was the same passage. Earlier on, it referred, it referred to no breath left in him. Then it says his soul came back into him. So the breath of life, the term the breath of life and the soul are sometimes used synonymously. Let us look at the famous case of the witch of Endor. As I try to wrap up quickly. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 28 from verse 6 to 19. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. I wonder why he didn't ask for a man. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, and he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. For we has cut off the mediums and the wizards from the land. Why then are you laying a sneer for my life to bring me to death? But Saul swore, swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, no punishment will come upon you for this thing. And then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. Then the woman saw Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, Have no fear. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming out of the earth. Well, we know, we know the story, so in the interest of time, I won't go through every detail of it. But what is important is that one, God had outlawed witchcraft. You can find that in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 31. Do not, do not turn to mediums or wizards. Do not seek them out. Do not be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. So God had outlawed it. So first of all, in this narration, this is not an endorsement of what Saul did. 
if Samuel was in heaven, he should be coming down, not coming up from the earth, right? Why, why is he coming up from the earth? It's very interesting that when Saul asked of her, she said she saw a God. What God did she see? Is a God she said she saw, I know. She saw a God. That's the first thing that she saw. A God. And he said, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up. So she saw a God, and she said, is an old man coming up? Something. And it's a God, she said she saw. Old but it's an old man coming up. And by that time, the Spirit of God had departed Saul. An old man is coming up and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed to the ground and did obeisance. He's a king doing obeisance. That alone alerts you that there is some things about this account that should not be taken on face value. She saw a God and said, there's an old man coming up. And Samuel in his stupor, he knew, Saul in his stupor said he knew it was, that it was Samuel. Here is, here is the rebuke. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons shall be with me. How come Saul and his sons would be with Samuel, who is supposed to be with the Lord? How come Saul would end up with Samuel, who is supposed to be with the Lord, after all of these transgressions? He said, tomorrow you will be with me. So there's a lot of flaws. A lot of flaws in the traditional understanding of this. And which cannot access somebody who is supposed to be up in heaven. If somebody's up in heaven with God, in Abraham's bosom, how can a witch call them down? That would, that would, that would lend, that would have serious questions about our security, about our, our salvation and security, because not anymore we can be summoned. There's no security in that kind of salvation. If that request, that request could only be given of God if Samuel was with God. Why would God honor the request of a witch? Why would God honor the request of a witch? In 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13, so Saul died for his unfaithfulness. He was unfaithful to the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. So this is why God put him to death. He would not have rewarded him by putting him, putting him with the faithful Samuel. This was simply a demonic experience that Samuel, that Saul had experienced. The eternal worms. Isaiah 66. And they shall go forth and look at the dead bodies of the men that have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die. Their fire will not be quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. This is referring to the shame at that time. The shame of that kind of death. If you died a certain way, it was shameful. In, I'll give you an example of that. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33. Jeremiah 25 and verse 33. And those slain by the Lord on that day shall extend from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall be dung on the surface of the earth. 
So there you have it. This is in the sense that it was a disgraceful way to die. What really is death? As we try to wrap up. What really is death in scripture? In Acts chapter 7 and verse 16. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Lord lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this. He fell asleep. This is how scripture views death. As asleep. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. And it's saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue from the beginning, as from the beginning of creation. So since the fathers fell asleep, that is how the scripture sees their death. That they were asleep. The dead have no knowledge, as I had quoted before. In Psalm 88, verses 10 to 12. Will you show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in destruction? So the dead cannot be praised in God. So your lovely grandmother is not at the feet of Jesus singing his praises. The dead cannot praise God. In Job chapter 14 and verse 12. So man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. This is how his... The point of this was that it was seen as sleep. In Daniel, Dan, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there you have it again. They are asleep in the dust of the earth. The resurrection. One of the problems with this immortal soul is that it renders the resurrection redundant and unnecessary. What's the purpose of a resurrection if people have an immortal soul? If you have an immortal soul, now what are you being resurrected from? If you have an immortal soul and you have received your reward of going to eternal hell, what are you being resurrected to? And if you are in, you are already in heaven. But I tell you, if I'm in heaven and I, I get wind that a resurrection is coming up, I'd be fretting. So I, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe the first time, yeah, yeah, and then I have to go back over the process again. I, I, I wouldn't want to be doing that. There must be some security. In John chapter 5 and verse 28. John chapter 5 and verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So all the dead are in the grave. That is absolutely clear. Psalm 115 and verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down in silence. This is kicking a man when he's down. How much more ticks? I'm just piling on and on and on and on. Okay. This, it, this eternal hellfire doctrine is dead. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. And now has manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There it is contrasted once more. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52, the resurrection chapter. This is what you'll hear when you go to funerals. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. This is speaking about the, those who are faithful. Immortality is given by God at the resurrection. It is not inherent in human beings. It is at the resurrection that it is granted. 
human beings are not inherently immortal. In Romans chapter 2, verse 6 to 7. For he will render to every man according to his works. Those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor in, and immortality, he will give eternal life. That is the purpose of the resurrection. To raise the faithful, to give them eternal life. What about Paul's statement in uh, Philippians 1 and verse 21? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But Paul did not believe that at death he would be immediately resurrected. So that cannot be understood in that light. In 2 Timothy verse 4, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So he did not believe that it was better he, he, he died right now and went to the Lord. That's not what this text, the previous text was saying. Because he believed that it is at Christ's coming that he will get his reward. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, we are of good courage. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. We are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This, is, this was a text that was used with the, with the one I had mentioned previously, but Paul clears that up in uh, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. In 1 Corinthians 15, it makes it clear that we are absent from the body until that we the body is dead until the resurrection. In conclusion, in conclusion, this doctrine of the ever-burning hell is not scriptural. It is not biblical. And it casts a negative light on our God. The hallmark of the church of God is it shows the love of God. There's a hallmark of any true Christian church. The hellfire doctrine teaches a sadistic God. The God we serve is not sadistic. He is ever loving. He's ever powerful and he's all knowing. Our understanding of the church of God, of the reward of the saints, reconciles our understanding of scripture. Let us use what we have been given, this knowledge, as both a warning and a motivation. So that when Christ returns, he can say to us individually, well done, good and faithful servant.